I just had the absolute pleasure of spending time with controlled remote viewing expert, Lori Lambert Williams. Lori is an amazing and fun teacher, and she's super knowledgeable about her subject matter. I've been wanting to have Lori on the show since the very, very beginning. And finally, today we made it happen. I didn't even have to ask Lori all the questions I had in my outline because she's just so full of knowledge. She was able to just talk freely and tackle everything I wanted to know and then some. She even told a story that apparently she's never told on any other interview before and hasn't put in any of her books. So I feel super special. Hang on all the way till the end where Lori talks about all of the free resources on her website, along with her free masterclass, which is the class that I took to find out about Lori and spark my interest in learning about controlled remote viewing myself. She's super generous. There's lots of free resources. Everything that you could want to know is there. And she assured me within the next week or so, her calendar will be filled up on the website with upcoming other classes. And there are plenty to choose from. So hang on and get ready to listen to the amazing Lori Lambert Williams. Spirit, does it stay? Does it go? The fact is, spirit does survive death. Our loved ones are all around us. Love survives. Spirit survives. All is not lost. Welcome to the All Is Not Lost podcast. Here's your host, psychic and evidential medium, Rianne Maldonado. Welcome back to All Is Not Lost. Today, I am super excited for the interview I have today with my very special guest that I've been trying to connect with for a little while. She and I have had some scheduling difficulties, but we're finally here. Um, today, I am visiting with Lori Lambert Williams. She is the founder and CEO of Intuitive Specialists. She is a controlled remote viewing expert, yay, and the <laughs> author of two books, one called Boundless and the other one called Monitoring. And welcome, Lori. I'm so happy to have you. Thanks for having me, Rianne. This is super fun. I'm really glad we finally got to to connect. Oh, me too so much. And I just, I've been dying to tell you that when I signed up for your mastermind, your little mini mastermind class, mm -hmm. first of all, super gen generous of you to do that way, way cool to let people kind of get their feet wet, dip their toes in and see if it's something that they want to do. But you said two things in there that stuck out for me that made me love you right away. <laughs> One, you're like, I did this so that you could make sure you like my teaching style, which is brilliant. And two, <laughs> I think you even have notes here that you said, you're not here for my videography skills. You're here because I have something to teach you. And I thought, she's awesome. You're just so <laughs> down to earth and real. And I appreciated that about you right off the bat. Oh, thank you so much. You know, it's funny because I hired two professional videographers starting oh. years ago to film my classes because I thought I'll just have a professional do it and I'll have <laughs> yeah. this really beautifully done professional videos and it all kind of fell apart it, they just got, got lost in the editing and um, mm. they got used to making courses both of them were accomplished videographers in other realms like making music videos and wedding videos and one had made movies wow but editing a course just you know just mm. it just was way too much for them and they couldn't do it and so it finally fell through the cracks on both in both with both cases. And I finally thought, well, I'm just going to have to learn how to do it myself and, and just do it myself and just say, hey, you know, hope you get the learning because the videography isn't perfect because I'm doing it myself. <laughs> well, it was it was brilliant. <laughs> you know, what it taught me right there in that moment is that stuff shouldn't matter. What you have to offer is what matters. And being a new podcaster, I struggled with a lot of trying to get things perfect right away before I would do anything. And I finally found that that was like just keeping me from doing it. Yes. And yeah, having to rely on other people to edit for me, I had to learn it. I'm learning it still. Um, so I just valued that about you. And I think that that is what made me feel comfortable to reach out to you is that That's you were very real. 
Thank you so much, Rian. I'm glad you did too, because I love talking with you. And 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 you know, we may reach people that have never heard of CRV before. Um, right, right. Well, you know. Oh no, go ahead. I'm sorry. I have a passion to raise the consciousness of the planet. You know, that's my passion. And it comes through when you talk. And my very first um, experience ever even hearing about it was through the documentary Third Eye Spies. I was watching it with my husband and son, and they were super fascinated. My husband, because he had been in the military, and my son, he was like right at that kind of age. And and I was like, wow, that's really cool because of like all the psychic stuff. But then it kind of went off my radar until September. I was at a mediumship conf uh, workshop in Lilydale, New York. And oh, one night, I know. And then one <laughs> night, some ladies and I stayed up really late on my bed in my little Airbnb room. And somehow remote viewing came up. And I'm like, wait a minute, that's been on my radar before. So when I got home from New York, I started just doing some internet searching and I found you in your master class. And like, I took it right away. <laughs> so, That's so great. I'm so glad. Yes. Yeah, so for the listeners here who don't even know what we're talking about, why don't you tell, well, I want you to tell a little bit about you and your awesome story, how you got into this with Lynn, because that's a brilliant story, but what is CRV and why should everybody care? <laughs> well, <laughs> it's a good idea to know what CRV is first and controlled remote viewing is a technique that was developed for the U.S. military. And what happened was during the Cold War, the Russians were getting a lot of our military secrets and we didn't know how they were getting them. And so I say we as an American, not as part of the government. But, <laughs> yes. uh, but I generously include myself, right? <laughs> but, um, you know, they didn't know how are they getting our secrets? And then this man defected from Russia and he had documents showing that Russia had a psychic spying program, which blows people's mind. As soon as they hear that, they're like, Russia have a psychic spying program? Not only do they have a psychic spying program, but they were using it to get our military secrets and they were being successful. So our government said, well, if they have something like this and it's successful, we must figure it out and develop something you know, similar. Mm -hmm. So they went to Stanford Research Institute, which was the big top secret think tank. And two physicists there, Harold Puttoff, and Russell Targ were both pioneers of the laser. A lot of people don't know that, but they were pioneers of the laser. And I like to tell people that because it shows that they are just weirdos. You know, these guys are brilliant physicists who helped to pioneer the laser. And uh, they said, they, they explained what the problem was. And these guys started doing tons of research. And over the years, they researched telepathy, clairvoyance, and all these things to the point that they have more concrete proof that these things are real than the FDA has proving that aspirin is effective as a pain reliever. That's crazy. And aspirin's been around a long time. Mm -hmm. And so they were doing all these experimentations and they, they had a really interesting incident happen because in the beginning, everybody was pretty dubious, like, Oh, come on. Is this, you know, really real? So they was, people were dubious. And um, so they had this incident happen where they asked this, I think he was a Colonel, and he was a medical doctor. And they said, hey, pick something, you know, something that you know about. And we're going to invite these two volunteers to see if they can uh, remote view whatever you pick. So he chose a hunting cabin that he owned that was in the woods out in the middle of nowhere. But unbeknownst to him, underneath the hunting cabin was a top secret military complex. Hidden Whoa. underground. And so... He gets this retired detective from Burbank, California, named Pat Price, who had demonstrated amazing psychic ability. And then they got this artist from New York City named Ingo Swan. And they say, okay, guys, we have a target for you. The target's a location. We want you to describe this location. And it's supposed to be the hunting cabin. But since the the, the this this thing was right underneath it, being men, they went immediately to the top secret installation right and they found themselves in this room and uh, each one of them doing this individually they each found themselves in a room that had filing cabinets and they said well you know i just stuck my head in the filing cabinet like because you know because you're like a ghost so you can just put your head <laughs> in the, so they stuck there in the filing cabinet and they were reading the names on the files and the names were code names all having to do with billiards like like cue ball and eight ball and things like that 
so they have so they're writing this down both of them in their sessions you know cue ball eight ball and they're these top secret code names for this major project that was going on that was ultimate you know very very ultra ultra top secret so when when the colonel gets it he looks at this and goes this is garbage this thing this doesn't work at all this proves it doesn't work um, and he sends it up the chain to the top brass and you know and this since he didn't know about this installation he didn't realize what he was holding and he sends it up and oh. these people freak out and they they launched a major investigation into both of these volunteers to see if they were double agents or something and they wow. couldn't find any indicators that they were and when they couldn't find any indicators that they were they went uh-oh holy you know what yeah that means there are no secrets you know, if people can mentally go into our top secret installation and read the code names off our files, then we can't secure anything really, you know, so they that's were freaking crazy, out. They crazy. Were really out. but that's what proved to them that this was real and that they had to do something about it. So, um, so what they did was they said, okay, we've got this research arm in Palo Alto, California at Stanford Research Institute. We need to create an applications arm where we're taking soldiers and training them how to do this, right? So they, they got these abandoned, condemned buildings <laughs> in, that were in, on the property of Fort Meade. In Maryland, and they and there was weed. There were weeds around these buildings. The guys had to walk into work every day, going through like chest high weeds to get there because they didn't want anyone to know that the buildings were being used. So I if think they wanted, if, did Lynn, if, Lynn talked about that in his book, right? I thought I read yeah. that he was like, "This looks abandoned and scary." Right. Okay. Same ones. And if they wanted to do something like they needed to replace a doorknob, they couldn't go to the normal surplus place you would go to from for the army, you know, that supplies things like that, because they couldn't admit that they existed. Right. So they instead would have to go to like a dump or, you know, <laughs> you know so, <laughs> to get to get what they needed to repair things. And they didn't have any air conditioning, so they just opened the doors on both ends of the building, and it would get really hot in the summer wow. and be cold in the winter. You know, they were unheated. <laughs> So oh my God! These poor guys had pretty rough conditions to work in. Um, so they so they had this program, and this was the applications arm. Um, years ago, I got a phone call from um, a producer from the Travel Channel, and she said, "Hey, I'm working on um, a series right now, and and the episode of the series that I'm working on right now is called Secrets of the White House." And she mm. said, and I just interviewed Jimmy Carter and I asked him what was like the, the most outstanding or weird, weird thing from your presidency. And he said, oh, it was when the remote viewers found the downed Russian plane. So this Russian plane had crashed and it had like top technology on it. And so the Russians were scrambling to find it. And so were the Americans and we wanted to get to it first. So the, um, so these, these remote viewers gave them GPS coordinator coordinates where they would find the plane. And oh they said, they looked at the coordinates and said, there's no way the plane could be there. Jimmy Carter, Carter didn't do this, but whoever got the information, uh -huh. oh, no way, no way it could be there. So they, they ignored it. But the next day, something happened that caused them to have to send people to that GPS coordinate for a totally different reason. And there was the downed Russian plane. Oh my gosh. Blew Jimmy Carter's mind, you know? And oh. so when he told her about it, this producer, she was like, I have to find out more about this. So it happened that she had a friend that was a friend of mine. We had a mutual friend and she contacted this friend and said, do you know anything about this remote viewing? And she said, oh yeah, you have to call Lori. So she called me and I ended up setting up interviews for her uh, like three-way interviews we did with um, Lynn Buchanan and then with Mel Riley. And Mel was the first remote viewer put into the unit. And he is also the only, of all the soldiers that went into the unit, he was the only one that served two tours of duty, duty in the mm. unit. So when he first started, they were kind of just doing a thing where they would send, like, I'm going to send Bill out to the McDonald's at the corner of 10th and Adams, and I'm going to make that um, the target for John. Okay, John, we want you to close your eyes and see if you can tune into Bill and tell and describe where Bill is. So then Bill draws the golden arches, for example, right? Or, or John draws the golden arches, kind of showing where Bill is. And then they afterwards would load John into a car and drive him to the McDonald's so he could see what his target was. And that would be the way they would give John feedback, right? And that was the way they did it initially. Then when Mel came back for a second tour of duty after a four-year 
um, tour where he was doing reconnaissance. He came back and it was all the CRV structure. So CRV is a written structure that allows you to sit at a table with paper and a pen and you're using a set of written protocols to help separate imagination from true psychic perceptions. And uh, so you're just writing your thoughts on paper. You're also saying them out loud, but you're doing it in a structured way. And it gives the conscious mind something to keep it busy, like remembering where to put stuff on the page, while the subconscious mind can easily flow with information that it wants to give. And so it's pretty uncanny. I just came straight from uh, a meeting with some of my advanced viewers, and I had given them a target that was an incident that happened in New Delhi, India, where all 4,000 rhesus monkeys descended upon New Delhi. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And it was just, it was so amazing what these viewers found in this remote viewing because they, one of them felt like she was one of the monkeys and she just was writing down, you know, she was setting aside thing. We try to set aside nouns because our mantra is describe, don't identify. And so she was setting aside things like monkeys, India. <laughs> and she said, I feel like I just love animals and I feel like I'm one of these monkeys and, and, wow. and this is just so fun. And, and you know, she, wrote, she wrote all this stuff about being with the monkeys in New Delhi. And it was just uncanny because, you know, they're completely blind to the target. They have no idea what they're remote viewing. And, yes. uh, and then in another, another incident, I gave some of the class, um, Lewis and Clark, expedition. Mm. And, uh, and so one of the viewers started out saying, I feel like this is going to be about Lewis and Clark somehow and their journey. And another viewer said, uh. this, this isn't really so much of an event as it is a journey. This is some kind of a journey that lasted a long time. And they were just so uncannily accurate that, you know, it just, it, the funny thing is I've been doing this 26 years and it's still, I, I haven't lost my sense of wonder about it. You know, like how, I, we're all so connected. <laughs> we are. All I so love. I love that you say that because it comes through your passion for it, and you make me excited for it. <laughs> I can't wait to take your full class classes. <laughs> yeah, um, we have one of the things too that makes our and I had a passion for because when I started this, um, I I stumbled upon Lynn Buchanan because I met this colonel at a conference I was attending. And I had had a dream about this colonel before I actually spoke to him. And I, I had dreamt that I was asking him about a colonel that I had just met in Amarillo, Texas. So here I am, I'd never met a colonel in my life. And suddenly in three days time, I met two colonels. And I dreamt that I was asking the one about the other. So the next morning I show up early and this guy's standing there, we're alone outside the ballroom doors, total strangers. I'm like, um, I had a dream about you last night. <laughs> best story now, keep in mind i was i was in my 30s at the time so i was a lot cuter <laughs> my mom's always like if you want a man to remember you tell him you had a dream about him but, <laughs> so this guy's like really what did you dream and so i told him about the dream it was a pretty ordinary dream and he said oh uh, what branch of the military was this colonel in and i said i don't know i think i think he was in military intelligence and he goes, oh, that's interesting. I was in military intelligence. And as soon as he said that, the cover of a book I had just seen on the new arrival shelf at the bookstore flashed in my mind's eye. And it was turquoise and black. You know, I love that combination. Um, and I picked the book up because the cover kind of caught me. And then I looked through the book and I put it back down. But I said, oh, my gosh, have you seen that new book? And the guy's like, what new book? And I said, it's turquoise and black. It's just came out. It has something to do with psychics in the military. And he goes, I can't believe you're asking me about that book. That book is Psychic Warrior by David Morehouse. And I was uh, a, the psychologist in charge of that program for 20 years. But the thing that happened oh next week, he was so blown away that I, this total stranger walks up and says, I had a dream about you and then asks about this book. So he was so he starts leaning into my space and saying, oh, my gosh, are you artistic? Do you remember maps easily? Do you have a photographic memory for numbers? And he just started asking me all these questions. Those were the three that I remember, the first three. Wow. And I just wanted to run away. I mean, I just wanted to go, ah, get away from me and run away. Wow. It scared me. It's it just he just sort of freaked me out when he did that. Um, and he, I think he sensed that I was like really nervous and wanting to, wanting to get as far away from it as possible. And then by this time, people are filing into the ballroom and the thing's getting ready to start. And so I'm like, I have to go to my seat. <laughs> He's like, before you leave, before you leave, when you get home, 
go on the internet, and this was 1996, and the internet was still pretty new at that time. Yes. Go on the internet and look up controlled remote viewing. So I really made a note of that. I think I sat down and wrote it down and everything. And when I got home, that was the first thing I did was got on the internet and looked it up. And this website pops up and it says, what is CRV? It has a question mark. And then I read what came under it. And I felt like, I felt like the chorus of angels were, you know, singing hallelujah because I had really been searching. I'd been a missionary for 20 years and I had been searching for a way to reconcile all the supernatural things that had happened to me my whole life of seeing ghosts and having precognitive dreams and, you know, hearing internal voices guiding me and saving my life and all these weird things to my Christian belief system Mm -hmm. Of, you know, which was pretty binary at the time. CRV has really opened my, my belief system quite a bit. But at the time, it was pretty limited. It was like God and the devil, you know, <laughs> yes. Jesus and the bad guys, you know, <laughs> it was like yeah. black and white, you know. And, um, and so, you know, I just wanted something that could help kind of help me understand who I was and why I was this way. Because before that, I thought everybody had these experiences. You know, I just thought Mm -hmm. that was normal. And when I discovered that it wasn't, that most people didn't have these experiences, then I was like, well, then what, what am I? And what does that make me if I am, if I am having these experiences? And so this made it sound like, hey, everybody has psychic ability. It's a normal sense, just like hearing, seeing, smelling, tasting, feeling. It's a normal sense. And I went, oh, Yay. It's normal. It's human. It's human to be this way. But our society really squashes it, as you know, I mean, Mm -hmm. for the most part, other than the fact that most television shows now have some kind of supernatural element to them. (laughs) Right. But in the real world, people are uncomfortable with it still. And that was one other reason I really wanted to talk to you too, is um, how you did reconcile your Christian belief and all your background in the years you had been a minister uh, in ministry. That was a long time to then accept that you weren't doing the work of the devil. Um, <laughs> and I think I read in your book. Um, and by the way, I said to my, the last person I interviewed this week, I'm a total nerd. I basically like read the books and then do book reports. So I have lots to talk about, but, um, but in there, you said something about like you were kind of just mentioning your senses um if you like you could use your eyes for evil um right i was saying uh, can you say that yeah we have all these we we have the ability to see and and what if what if you know somebody uses their eyes to just look at porn or you know or murders or something does that make eyesight evil no you know eyesight is just normal if somebody chooses to use their eyesight to look at evil, what we consider to be evil or whatever, then that doesn't make eyesight itself evil. It just, maybe the person's not a really good person or something. I don't know. I don't mean to indicate that anybody who looks at porn is a bad person. I just, (laughs) you know, we can use our eyesight for lots of things. It's the same thing. If you think about a gun, a gun is an inert piece Mm -hmm. of metal, but if you're using that gun to kill people, then, you know, then that makes the person who's killing people bad, not the gun. I mean, the gun itself is an inert piece of metal. And I'm not trying to, to take sides in the gun debate at this at this point either, but I'm just saying, no. though, that, you know, people think there's so many people who are afraid of psychic ability because we mm-hmm. fear that which we don't understand. And so if you're afraid of psychic ability, um, then the tendency is like, you better watch out because you could get demon possessed. You know, I heard mm-hmm. that a lot. In the yeah, I, I hear that all the time. Be yeah. careful what you invite in. I'm like, um, I'm just talking to the dead grandma over there. You know, <laughs> <laughs> that's it. Like grandma's cool. <laughs> it's so funny because it, and so this was a, not an overnight transformation. In my okay. Life. Um, initially, and I, I feel like that's why the Lord led me. If God is, is guiding our lives and, and Christians are listening to this, I feel like the Lord led me to Lynn Buchanan, who's, that's whose website it was when I looked up mm-hmm. controlled remote viewing, because he had been, he was raised a Baptist and he oh, later yeah. was an, a, a Methodist minister. And I thought, man, if there was ever a person that would have been the perfect teacher for me, it was him because he really understood where I was coming from. Mm -hmm. And he was very gentle, you know, about everything. Cause I was fearful. I was like, I was, I was, I kept wondering, you know, is it okay for me to be doing this? 
you know, is it okay? Is it, is this okay to explore this? You know, am I, am I displeasing God? That was my biggest fear. I would be mm-hmm. displeasing God. And I feel like if, see, if, if somebody asked me the other day, I was doing some kind of webinar and they said, what's the biggest way that CRV or the biggest gift CRV has given you or whatever. And I said, it's helped me. It's given me freedom from fear because I was very fearful about displeasing God or sinning or getting demon possessed or whatever. And I have a hilarious story that I want to tell you that I, I've never put in any book or anything, but, uh, and I don't even think I've discussed it in an interview, but it's, oh it's, yay. it's so funny because, um, so I had just met my husband, my, my now husband and we were on his farm that was that's in southern New Mexico, and it's this old adobe house that was the first home built in that area, and it was built in 1865. Wow! And uh, so, so we were there, and 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 we were spending the weekend there, and and I um, I wasn't feeling well, and I got up at like three o'clock in the morning to go use the restroom, and I felt really sick, and I came out of the restroom, and there was a man standing in the, the hallway there. And I opened the door and he's standing there and, and just as solid as you are. And I screamed because you don't expect to see a man standing in your hallway yeah. in the morning. So I screamed and, and then I went, Oh gosh, I'm sorry, but you startled me because this man, um, he was Caucasian. He was wearing wire rim glasses. He was probably roughly around 60 years old. And he had kind of like a bad comb over. He was kind of balding. But <laughs> yes. over and, and, um, and he, but he was dressed like in clothes. He wasn't in pajamas and he was wearing pants, not jeans, but like slacks mm-hmm. and a, a tucked in plaid short sleeve shirt with button down front. And so as I'm looking at him and he's standing with his like sideways to me with a hand on his chest and his head cocked forward, looking at me like a very concerned posture, like, are you okay? And so my first thought after I screamed was this, it must be Jim. I'm thinking this has to be Jim because who else is, it's just the two of us in the house and I'm very myopic. I'm short, I'm very nearsighted and I didn't have my glasses on. So I'm thinking it has to be Jim. But then, then the next thought is, wait a minute, why would Jim be dressed? And he doesn't wear clothes like that. And so I'm, and Jim doesn't have that much hair. (laughs) (laughs) And so I, as, as all these thoughts are happening, like in a split second, right. And then I'm like, I think this is a ghost. And I stood there, just all the hair on my body stood up, you know, and I had chills and, and I'm just staring at him and he's staring at me and it felt like forever, Rianne. It felt like it went on forever. It probably lasted maybe a, maybe a full minute at most. And then he slowly faded away until he wasn't there anymore. And then I just went, I had to run right through that spot. There was no way to get to the bedrooms. There were four bedrooms. There was no way to get back to the bedrooms other than run through that spot. So I ran as fast as I could. I I burst into the bedroom where Jim was waking him up because I made a lot of noise and I leapt on the bed. So again, he sits up and he's like, what, what, what's the matter? What's the matter? And I said, I just saw a ghost. And, you know, and we had just, we were just in the, in the beginning of new love. Right. And yeah. so he, you just saw a ghost. He's like, was it an Indian? Cause his mother had always told him that a native American haunted the house. And I said, no, he said, well, what did it look like? And I said, well, it kind of looked like you. I said, I'm okay if it's a ghost, but if it was you, that's like, I'm not okay with that. That's creepy. But <laughs> I think yeah. it, like going out of his body and haunting the house. Right. <laughs> And so, um, so we decide, we sit up talking all night about it. We're all excited. And I think it was like three in the morning. So we talked until daylight. Wow. And we, and so then he says, well, we've got to find out who that was. She so said, so how about if I get out grandma's Ouija board and we'll, we'll, we'll see who this was. And I'm like, grandma's Ouija board? <gasps> How old is this Ouija board? Yeah, no joke. It must be like a really antique Ouija board. And he pulls it out. And it was, it was like an old William Fild fold or whatever that was a Ouija board. Wow. On the front were people like in, in, in turn of the century costumes, you know, long dresses. And the woman had her hair in a big, in you know, the thing with the knot on the top. And, and Do you still have that? Yes. Yes. I you you got to send me a picture of that. Oh my gosh. <laughs> And so it's this really old Ouija board. And so we we pull it out, but I'm still very much in that mental space of, you know, Ouija boards. uh Oh, you know, so I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute. If we're going to do this, we have to pray first. We have to pray. And he was very accommodating of my, even though he was not of the same belief system, he was very accommodating of my need to pray right to Jesus. And he was raised on the, on the, um, 
at, at the Apache Indian Reservation. Even though he's oh. white as a ghost, the guy he was white toe headed. The, the teachers would say, "Jimmy, it's pretty easy to find you on the playground. I'm like, oh, <laughs> white heads, you're the only white head." But um, anyway, so he but he was raised very much in a Native American belief system, you know. Okay. And so and so Christianity wasn't really part of his belief system but he just was so he was just so in love that he was just like yeah let's okay let's pray yeah so he would take his hands and i'm like jesus please protect us while we're using the ouija board and then i said this off and said you know this is kind of like saying god i'm about to fornicate but please don't let me get venereal disease <laughs> oh my gosh totally <laughs> but we went ahead and we used the ouija board and and what was really interesting was that the information that came out from the Ouija board said that this person, we were directly communicating with whoever it was that showed up to me last night, okay. said, my name is Hezekiah Hatch. And that's not like John Doe, you know, yeah. that's kind of an unusual name. My name is Hezekiah Hatch. And between 1924 and 1925, I was traveling between Texas and New Mexico regularly. And there was a car accident right in front of a farmhouse. And it's interesting because there was a two lane road in front of the farmhouse back in the olden days. And my, oh. and even when my, my husband was growing up on the farm, but now that road is completely gone and there is a big highway much further away, like an okay. like interstate highway. And so um, he said, and I, we were traveling on that road and there was an accident and I was traveling with two children that were my neighbors. They were four and five years old. He told us their names and everything. And he said, and they were killed and I was not injured in this accident. And oh, so yeah, I always felt very guilty and I'm drawn back to this place. So we're done with that. And I look at Jim and I'm like, Jim, I think I must have made all that up. I probably have a great imagination. I probably pushed that planchette. I, you know, it was probably all me. And he said, I don't so and so he goes let's go because the farmhouse didn't have it, it, it only barely had a phone it didn't have internet or anything so we went to his parents house where they had internet we got on his mom's computer and we typed we googled hezekiah hatch and up comes the picture of the man i saw no the, oh my god i have goosebumps everywhere the picture comes up and it's the man i saw and he was an ancestor of senator Orrin hatch Oh. And he was Mormon and he was commissioned by the Mormons to evangelize Texas and New Mexico between 1924 and 1925. That's all, that's all the information that was there, but it didn't talk about an accident or anything like that. But I, I was just like, Whoa, I mean, that blew us away. You know, we were, we were quite yeah. surprised by that. So <laughs> I'm, I'm stunned. I'm wow. What a cool story. Did you, because I know that you, I've read that you have psychic abilities already. And we've talked about a little bit. Was all of that information from the Ouija board or were you getting some psychic impressions as well? Well, I think things like Ouija board, tarot cards, crystal balls, all those runes, entrails. <laughs> yeah, entrails, yes. I think all of those things are tools for the subconscious to communicate through the body because, you know, the yeah. whole philosophy behind controlled remote viewing and how it works is that the conscious mind and the subconscious mind can't speak to each other directly because the subconscious mind doesn't speak in language. It speaks in images and feelings and things like that. So it has to work through the body. The human body is the link. So all of these things, whether they're Ouija boards or tarot cards or anything, palm mm -hmm. reading, you name it. These are merely tools or crutches, even we could say. And CRV is also, uh, you know, it's a tool that we use to access the subconscious and give the subconscious a way to communicate. A pendulum. If we use a yeah. pendulum to get a yes or no answer, you know, is the, or, you know, am I moving the pendulum? Right. Am I making it move? Is the pendulum, does the pendulum have a life of its own? No, the pendulum is an inert object. And it, and it, your subconscious mind is working through the body to give that answer to you through the pendulum. And so yeah. all of these things are tools. They're all tools. And so I feel like that's how the Ouija board works as well. You know, so okay. I was probably getting that stuff and then my hands were probably moving that planchette, but I didn't really feel like I was, you know what I mean? It felt like the that's planchette a... itself, but I think, you know, now that I understand how all this yeah. stuff works, I feel like, nah, it was probably the, you know, the subconscious mind just kind of moving that thing around through, you know. Yeah. Just, no, so. that's a great way to look at it because people often ask me about my mediumship and when I'm getting the impressions and the feelings and the thoughts um, from spirit, I, I did used to 
I didn't used to do it that way. I used to use tarot cards. Um, and then I got to a point where I, I didn't need them anymore, I guess. I, I don't know. I don't want to offend anybody by saying that, but it kind of be kind of got where I was just able to get the information and not need the tool. But now I'm reviewing and trying to think during a reading, what am I doing to keep my mind busy while I'm getting this stuff? I'm going to have to really pay attention to that. That's fascinating to yeah, think of. And you know, for the longest time, I fought the whole idea of mediumship for myself, not for, I, I believed in mediumship. Yeah. But I didn't want to be a medium. You know, I didn't want to be talking to dead people. But I had been <laughs> experiencing dead people my whole life from early childhood, you know. And so it's one of those things where you just keep resisting it and resisting it. Mm -hmm. And one one day, um, my husband, who is a retired forensic scientist, is wow. also a Reiki master. Oh, Interesting yeah, combination of mm -hmm. skills. Um, mm -hmm. and so when I met him, you know, he was still working as a forensic scientist, but he was also really excited about Reiki. And I had never even heard of Reiki and he had never heard of controlled remote viewing. So we, wow. we had been dreaming about each other before we met and we had been both being guided to, to that we were going to meet someone. And, uh, and then one morning when I was meditating, I heard go to the Unity Church. And I was like, is there even such a thing? You know, because I'm not, you know, and so I look in the phone book and there was a Unity Church in Amarillo. And so I went that Sunday, I went to the Unity Church and um, there was a woman there and she just seemed to be glowing. And it was, I heard this, my inner voice said, this is who you're supposed to speak to. But I couldn't even get to her because there were people surrounding her. So I asked, who is that lady? And they said, oh, she's the administrator here. And so I called the next day on Monday mm -hmm. and I said, I don't know why, but I'm supposed to meet you. And she said, oh, wonderful. Just come Thursday at two o'clock. So... <laughs> I, uh, and so on Thursday at two o'clock and I was super sick. I had been, uh, I had been bleeding for 40 days, like hemorrhaging with oh my for 40 days God. and I had been to three different gynecologists and they, they tried all kinds of pills and things and nothing was making it better. I wasn't getting any better. And I just felt like I was dying. Oh. Uh, so I, I go to this, you know, I called in sick that day to work and I, I get in the car and I drive to this unity church. And she's sitting on the stoop of the church next to this man. And I'm walking across the lawn to go greet them. And she had just told him, hey, this lady's coming. She, you know, he had just shown up. He was a friend of hers. He just shown up to say hi. And she had invited him to sit down and talk. And then she said, this woman's coming to meet me. She doesn't know why. <laughs> so then I'm crossing the lawn and he hears this voice in his head saying, there she is. <gasps> and so then... I walk up and we get immersed in this conversation for five hours about Reiki, about reincarnation, about mediumship, about CRV. Wow. And we're just like talking, the three of us just, you know, it was just the super exciting conversation. And I just knew these people are going to be very important friends in my life. Um, and as I left, I, I, the bleeding stopped and I was completely healed and it just spontaneously happened. Um, and so then he in, wow. invited me to come to Reiki and I started coming to Reiki and, and then he wanted to take CRV. So he started taking CRV classes. And, uh, and so that's how we ended up getting together. But he, I, it turned out that I'd been dreaming about him because I had never had a boyfriend with blue eyes, uh, a serious oh. boyfriend with blue eyes. And so suddenly I was dreaming about these blue eyes, you know, and, and uh, he has blue eyes. My husband has blue eyes. So oh. um, it, it was really funny. And he was dreaming about me as well. And, uh, and so we just kind of, we, oh, and that night when he went to bed, he got in bed and he, that little voice said, you can stop searching now. And so he just said, he just knew that we were supposed to be together. And um, oh. it took me a little while to, to get to that point where I, you know, where I thought of it more romantically. And initially I was kind of like, he's going to be like my best friend forever. But I never thought of it like romantically for, for a while until I had a dream in which Angel showed me like a whole bunch of stuff from his life and said, and this, this relationship is going to be really important. You really need to be together to accomplish certain things. Cause I would not be teaching or doing, having, having my intuitive specialist or anything, if it weren't for Jim, you know, he's, he's Aww. made it all. Uh, but uh, so these angels came and told me, and so Jim likes to joke with people. I knew from the minute I laid eyes on her that she was the one, but it took angelic intervention for her to figure out. <laughs> That is so cute and so romantic. Oh my gosh. I so, love that story. <laughs> well, Jim is just the, he's such a great support, you know, to, to allow me to do what I'm doing. And uh, so I don't remember, I started to tell you that he was a forensic scientist and a Reiki master, but I don't remember why there was a reason it had to do with 
his take, he took CRV and it was a really great viewer, but he became like a world-class monitor. And I wrote this book oh, called Monitoring. Yeah. But uh, mon uh, monitors can really help. Um, they can either really help or destroy a session. A okay. good monitor is really wonderful. A bad monitor is just terrible. <laughs> You're better off without a monitor than having a bad monitor. And so Jim um, just is like a natural born monitor and has monitored me on a lot of major projects that we've done. Um, so one of the things that happened though, with the whole mediumship thing, since I think a lot of your audience is interested in mediumship is my understanding. Is that right? Um, you know, I kind of talk about everything, paranormal mediumship, couldn't wait everything. to talk to you, everything. So di directed, however. Well, I just, you know, I, I was really resistant to the whole thing and, and, uh, I was happy that I was having all these experiences that I couldn't deny. And then one night this man came in for Reiki and this is where I was actually going with this whole thing. Okay. We, went, we went around the Daisy path, but <laughs> this man came in for Reiki and, um, and we'd never met him before. And, um, so he came in and he laid down on the Reiki table and I was going to work with, um, with one of our Reiki practitioners mm -hmm. who's a, a Navajo Indian. Oh, and wow. so we both put our hands on this man. And the minute I put hands on him, oh my gosh, I was just like, I felt this, this intense, like sorrow, but this man, he was a, a large black man with the smile that would dazzle the room. You know, like when he smiled, oh. the whole room lit up and he was massively big, uh, just real tall. And he, um, you would just never guess that, that he had a problem in the world. You know, just looking at him, uh, you wouldn't guess that he had a problem in the world. And he, he laid down and I felt this deep sorrow coming from his heart. And I said, oh my gosh, you have a mommy pain in your heart. And I said, did you lose your mom in your 20s? And he said, yes. And he was probably 45 at the time. And he said, yes, I did. And then the next, you know, it was just one thing after another for like an hour. All this stuff was coming out. And I don't believe in giving unsolicited information. I feel like <laughs> right. really bad. But the, it just started coming out and I like couldn't help it. And I said, do you want me to stop? And he was like, no, please don't stop. And oh. everything I said, it was just this amazing communication with his mother, then his father, who had died when he was like 14 or 16, who had been a severe alcoholic and was telling me, you know, I was a terrible father and he's really angry at me and da, da, da. And everything he was confirming, he was like, yep, yep, yep. And then um, what was really interesting was uh, his dad finally said, hey, but he really isn't here because of any of this he's here to know more about his career and he goes that's right i really want to know more about my career and then we switched to the whole career thing and so that night when we got home jim goes right to bed and i was going to go right to bed too but i i ended up staying in the bathroom till like middle of the night kind of pacing around and kind of going what just happened you know how did that even work and finally i go when i go into the bedroom it's like two or three in the morning and the room is completely dark. And I hear Jim's voice coming out of the dark. And he goes, are you done fighting with yourself? Oh, he said, you are the only one who's doubting what's happening here. And I was like, okay, I've got to stop resisting this. And then when I did, it was amazing because you were talking about how information comes to you and how you were able mm -hmm. to let go of the tarot cards. Mm -hmm. um, and that, you know, information would just start coming and it would be almost like watching a movie. And a lot mm -hmm. of people expect that CRV remote viewing is like watching a movie, but actually I think I'm using a totally different part of my brain when I do controlled mm -hmm. remote viewing, as opposed to doing mediumship, because in, in controlled remote viewing, we learn to set aside nouns to focus on describing rather than identifying. And you learn really quickly how wrong a lot of times your assumptions, your naming assumptions, like that guy's a total jerk. And then you meet the person and it turns out to be a wonderful person. Have you, you know, something like that. We tend yeah. to throw labels out all the time. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and so with CRV, one of the things that it's done for a lot of people, it, besides increasing their confidence, reducing their fears, it also really helps people, to stop just judging and being so judgy because you learn really quickly that labels you slap on things are often incorrect. So if I have an envelope and I say, Rianne, I want you to just take a wild guess and just describe what's in this envelope. And you say, Lori, I think it's something red, smooth, and shiny. And we, you said, I think it's an apple. And then I pull it out and it's a fire engine. And so those names, those labels are where we get off track, even as psychics and mediums, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm automatically I have a, a, a good friend who's a very famous uh, psychic medium and she's been on television and she's really well known and she was working with the police on this murder case 
And she said, oh my God, he's stabbing her with a knife. And the policeman said, no, he's mm -hmm. not stabbing her with a knife. She's like, yes, yes, I see him. He's going, he's got his arm and he's going up and down with his arm. And she moves her fist up and down. And he says, no, he beat her to death with a baseball bat. So she I saw this. You saying that. She saw that, but then she put the knife in there, right? Mentally, mm -hmm. her conscious mm -hmm. mind did. So the conscious mind names things. The subconscious mind is the only part of you that's psychic. And that's the part that describes um, and so it's very different. I found that it's very, very different from mediumship and other types of psychic work uh, because you're using this, this amazing structure and the structure when everything else is going to pieces, if you're really upset, you know, and emotionally upset and stuff, it can be really hard to get psychic information right then because you have to set aside your emotions. But the structure of CRV can hold you up when everything else is falling apart. Mm. So it, that's, you know, it's just, it's really there. It's there to support you. And, uh, and so d depending on the nature of a person, whether they're really right-brained or really left-brained, really right-brained people that are completely right-brained oftentimes find the structure difficult to remember, you know, okay. you know, like we teach, you know, the very first thing you're going to do is put your name in the upper right-hand corner, <laughs> yes. you know, and the next day they'll be like, where do I put my name? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And so, um, and so, but very, and very left brain people have a hard time letting go and just mm. letting information flow because they're afraid they'll be wrong because they can tend to be very perfectionistic. Right. Mm. So I don't so know anybody we, like that. <laughs> <laughs> so we try to just kind of find a real balance there, you know, to, to help people and, and, and to get people used to the idea that they're not really remote viewing, they're remote sensing. They're going to sense things through all the different senses. Um, you know, you're going to get taste smells sounds uh textures um you're going to you're going to pick up colors and luminances you're going you know the the brightness or dimness of something you, then you'll start getting shapes and patterns and positions and measures and then you'll start getting conceptual information like political touristy you know intangible mm. things like fun <laughs> these are intangible concepts it was so exciting but also intimidating to learn about stop using nouns. Like I would need lots of practice on that. Um, <laughs> but it made a lot of sense to me. Um, you gave an example of a woman who was helping the police with somebody, I think a missing child. And she kept saying something going around and around and around. And then I think she labeled it a carousel. You so the Mary police, Mary go around. So police were going looking there when it ended up being a cement truck. Well, I, when I was at Lilydale, I was practicing with a friend, our mediumship, she had said something that was right on track for my grandfather, but then she labeled it. And I thought in my head, well, no, it's not him then. She lost me right then. And I thought of you right away, I, you know, when I was looking back on that, that we can't label, we, we really can't, we just need to let that information out. But it's mm -hmm. a new concept for most people. I mean, definitely for me. Definitely. definitely. It it's, it, it, and when I first started, it was just horrible. I remember sitting down and trying to do, you know, trying to write down, trying to remote view a, a picture in an envelope. And I was just, every word I wrote down was a noun. And Lynn would go, that's a noun, set it aside. And so you literally put it to the right side of the page. You just kind of set it, that the right side of the page becomes like your garbage can in, yeah. in the beginning <laughs> stages. And so I was just setting, I was having to set every word aside because it was all a noun. And I got really frustrated. And I was like, everything's a noun. <laughs> yes. I'm worried about that. When I take your class, I'm going to be like, everything's a noun. I don't know what to do. <laughs> You, you know, it takes practice, like anything new that you're learning, you have to develop those neural pathways, but you do eventually get really used to it. And then you get, and sometimes if you're really like remote viewing a lot, I, I would get to the point where I'd be talking to somebody, I'd be like, you know, those big gray things out in the ocean that, that planes land on, you know, <laughs> mean aircraft carrier, I'm like, yeah, aircraft, you know, I would just start describing stuff instead of naming things because my nouns were gone. Uh, but but it's, uh, it's, it's definitely a really great tool. It also cured me in my fear of heights. You know, I had a terrible fear of heights and uh, mm -hmm. like a phobia. And so Lynn would just, back in the olden days, I like to joke that back in the olden days when we didn't <laughs> have digital cameras or smartphones and we just had to, we had to 
physically make targets for people. So boy, a real exciting moment was if you went to your library and you were able to buy big bags of old National Geographic magazines for a buck. Oh, you know, we'd be like, wow. we struck gold. And we would sit down and just make tons of targets. And so we'd have stacks of targets that were cut out from National Geographic and glued onto paper, you know, for our oh my for gosh. view. And, um, and so, you know, Lynn would, would give me like 10 targets in an envelope to remote view. And so that I over, you know, so I could have some to practice the next month or whatever. And he would always slip in a bunch of height ones in there so that I would oh. get over my fear of heights. And I did. That's crazy. Since then, yeah, since then I've done, I've been dropped from the top of a crane, you know, those huge cranes that yeah. to build skyscrapers. Yes. Uh, yeah. Wrapped in a, wrapped in a rug and pulled up to the top of a chain and dropped from a bungee. And, oh my uh, gosh. And I've done parasailing 600 feet above the ocean. And How I've fun. done a lot of high, high things since then that have been really fun that I wouldn't have been able to do had Lynn not worked with me to help me overcome my fear of heights through CRV. That <laughs> is really exciting. I'm, and I'm, I'm sure most of my listeners had no idea that this was even possible because I didn't know until I took your class and read your book and I've started Lynn's book too. It's really amazing. And um, one question, because I know we're getting towards the end, but you mentioned something that was really important to me as a mom. I have five kids. I think you have double mine, right? We have <laughs> nine, nine kids. Okay, almost <laughs> double. Um, but you talked about using CRV on your kids to keep them safe. And I love that idea because, I mean, let's face it, I've got two middle school girls and I want to keep a close eye on them. But what I want you to talk to me about for just a second, if you can, when I've had people come to me as clients, um, but kind of more in the old days when I was still doing tarot, I, I kind of got a different caliber of client. I, I don't want to say anything negative, but different caliber. And they would ask me questions that we would consider psychic spying, like, oh, who's my ex-boyfriend dating now? Things mm -hmm. like that. And I would have to tell them, I, I, I can't do that for you. That's crossing a line. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously using CRV on your children, I don't think it's crossing a line because it's just a parenting tool, but it, it would it ever be considered not good psychic spying or are, are there, are there ethics kind of there, or can you talk about yeah, that line? Ethics. One of the things I discovered about ethics, we had formed a committee back in 2004. We wanted to create like a really top notch remote viewing guild of like the very best, best, best remote viewers. And we were, we were having people jump through all kinds of hoops, including ourselves, because we wanted to be okay. in the field. Too. So we wanted to put ourselves to the same, same rigors that we were demanding <laughs> of others. And so um, this was like, you know, it was, and so one of the things that really kind of stalled us was the discussion of ethics, because oh. we found that all these good people that were in the room, they were all good people. I'd never, I didn't consider any of them, you know, evil or unethical but everyone had a different concept of what was ethical. Mm. So I got a letter from a woman saying, I'll pay you $500 if you do a target for me. And I wrote back and said, you want me to spy on your husband to see if he's cheating on you, but I, I don't do those types of targets. I consider it unethical. And she wrote back and said, oh, you're right. Oh, I'm very, you know, I apologize. Thank you very much. Because, you know, so. <laughs> you know, yeah. Um, uh, and so that's the thing is that you, you have to go by your own code of ethics. I, mm -hmm. I know people that I love and think are very ethical who will cheat on their taxes regularly. You know, mm -hmm. they, they consider it, why should I give my money to Uncle Sam? You know, Trump doesn't pay Good taxes, point. you know, or, or you know, uh, what's the guy that owns Amazon, uh, Bezos? Yeah. Well, Bezos doesn't pay taxes. Why should I pay taxes? And they consider it perfectly ethical to cheat on their taxes. Um, I don't, mainly because I don't want to get in trouble. I'm kind of a rule. Yeah. I'm scared of the IRS of all things. <laughs> and also it's, it's, it can really, you know, if you're, if you have a mission, it's better just to cross your T's and dot your I's so that you don't have to stop your mission to, to go to court and all that, you know, get, mm -hmm. because you're not in trouble for not paying your taxes. So um, I don't like to cheat on my taxes, but, uh, but yet the person or the people that I know that do that, I consider them wonderful ethical people. You know what I mean? So we, yeah. we managed some issue. I also had some of the people in the room who said, I consider it perfectly ethical to view someone's spouse and see if they're cheating on them. And so we couldn't agree on the ethics. <laughs> that stalled mm. the point. <clears throat> so ethics is a really hot topic, really. I think that um, for me, 
Yeah, when my kids were kids and I felt they needed to be protected, then I didn't consider it a lack of ethics at all. Mm -hmm. And what was really interesting was um, our boys, we we have two boys that are 14 months apart. And mm -hmm. um, so they both left home kind of early. One was 17 and the other was, I think, 18. Uh, one went to join the Coast Guard at 18. The other one at 17 went to California to train to go to China as a missionary. Oh, so wow. he was in California. The other one was in Florida, opposite ends of the country. Yeah. And we had just heard about controlled remote viewing. I had just come back and just learned about it. I told my husband about it. I'm like, okay, uh, you know, let's try it. So he goes, okay, I'm going to try it. I'm going <laughs> to lay down and I'm going to remote view. We didn't know even what remote viewing was at all. We had no technique at all. But he goes, I'm going to remote view Michael, who's in California, and we're going to see what he's doing. So he lays down and I decided I'll be the monitor. I have a notebook. I'll just write down whatever you say. <laughs> he says, okay. He's got his eyes closed. He says, I'm seeing him in a room in front of a computer. And he keeps lurking, looking nervously over his shoulder. I think there might be children in the room that he's irritated at and he's looking over his shoulder. And so that's all he said. So I wrote that down. And so we send a letter to Michael. We say at Thursday at 2.30 PM, were you in front of a, a computer nervously looking over your shoulder. And he writes back and says, when I first read the email, I thought, no way, because I don't even own a computer. And I have to go to my friend's house to get on their computer to read my email. He said, but then I looked at the date and the time and we had gone to Kinko's and asked the manager if he would oh. donate an hour so we could do a newsletter. And I was looking nervously over my shoulder because we had reached the end of the hour and we weren't done with the newsletter. And I was afraid <gasps> he was getting mad. So there were no children oh. involved. That was all. Okay. You know, the, the, the naming part, but, uh, but that was accurate. So he was kind of like, Oh, wow. You know, they can kind of yeah. see me then with, I said, well, I, it's my turn, my turn. I want to be, yeah. be my son, Dustin, who's in the Coast Guard in Cape Canaveral. So I'm, I close my eyes my, my husband's there with <laughs> and I'm like, I'm seeing him in a huge gigantic room with really high ceilings. And he's with a bunch of men and they're all carrying gigantic white boxes. Wow. So I sent a letter to him at this date on this time, were you in a big room with a bunch of guys carrying giant white boxes? And he writes back and says, Jesus Christ, mom, I was in a warehouse <laughs> with a bunch of guys and we were moving washing machines. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so I pretty much convinced those guys that this is real, you know, I mean, yeah. And it's, my son one time said to me now, you know, he's in, a, they're both in their forties now. Uh, but at that point, point, he said, mom, it was really weird growing up with remote viewers as parents. It was really, I, really tough. I bet. <laughs> well, said, my kids are like, it's weird growing up with a psychic mom who talks to dead people. But now when I start spying on them <laughs> in a different way, it's going to be even weirder. <laughs> oh my gosh. So he said, we were so afraid to, to, to misbehave. I mean, you know, to do something because we knew you would know, um, you know, he got, I, he's the one that I joke about that. He, he climbed out his window one night and went to the end of the driveway and his dad was waiting for him at the end of the driveway. It's two o'clock in the morning. Cause he was, a girl had offered that if he would come to her house in the middle of the night, he would get lucky. And he was only 16. So he had never oh my God. before. And so, uh, and so my, my husband was there at the end of the driveway. He goes, you go back in the house. You're not going to go make love to that girl. You know, and he, he said, oh he my said, God, no way I could get away with anything, you know? So, uh, wow. Yeah. It's valuable it's a valuable tool. tool. Yeah. It's a valuable tool. I think especially for parents, it's important. Um, and for, you know, I've had parents who've told me, student parents who told me that like they were at a camp and their kids vanished right when they were going to load up in the car to leave the camp. Suddenly their kids were nowhere to be found. Two kids, two teenagers. And so the dad's like, oh my gosh, you know, we got to leave and we can't find the kids and you know, what's going on. And mom goes, just a minute, sweetie, I'll just sit down and do a quick session. And she does sits down and does a quick remote viewing session says, I know right where they are. And she and her husband drove right to where they could find them. And they had wow. taken, they had jumped in a rowboat and had gone down to, you know, down the river and because oh they didn't want to go home. They wanted to stay at the camp. They so, wanted to you know, stay. They found them really quick because mom did a quick remote viewing session. <coughs> Excuse me. No worries. Oh, yeah, my... you get really dry throats. Yeah, all this talking and laughing. One thing I wanted to tell you, Rianne, is that <coughs> if you um, if your audience is interested, mm -hmm. they can take that same free master class that you took. And yes, I, I talk created, about that. I created that class really so that people that 
want to see, you know, maybe people who've never really explored their psychic ability or, or even if you have, <coughs> but you want a, a more definite way of controlling it, mm -hmm. um, you can go to my website and uh, I guess, is there a way we'll be able to put like a URL up? Yep. Because I'll put everything the, in the notes. Yeah. The URL is um, HTTPS. <coughs> Goodness. I'm oh, so sorry. No worries. I, I can't, I have no fingers to point. I get <coughs> coffee. <before that. laughs> okay. So the URL is HTTPS colon backslash or forward slash forward slash intuitive specialists with an S at the okay. end of specialist dot com slash masterclass hyphen series okay. Okay. forward slash book. Oh, okay. Yeah. If you put the, the word book there, the reason we want you to put book there is that URL will it show us that you took the class because of this program or because you heard it from me, but not because we advertised, you know, we have advertised. Oh, on okay. And those, and those we track differently. So we'd really like to know that, you know, that you yeah. heard from the class from this, from this website. Uh, anyway, can so you that email? Is oh, class. sorry. Yeah, I can. Yeah, can you I email, email that? Email. Yeah, this this is a four part class. It's uh, I think it's actually almost four hours. So it's an mm -hmm. hour a day, close to close to an hour a day for four days, and you get an email every morning with the link, and you can click mm -hmm. on it and watch it. If you have any tech problems, we have a support team, support at intuitivespecialist.com, and they can walk you through it or send you the direct links or whatever you need uh, if you have any problems accessing it. Tech isn't always perfect, you know, and yeah. so. And it seems like when you're psychic or when you have a lot of like energies, we have more electronic problems than other people. Have you noticed that? Yeah. My, my interview just the other day, uh, my camera went out right in the middle. I'm like, what? Oh my God. Not the time to lose a camera. So yes, I, I agree with you and your class, just so the listeners know each day, it also includes handouts, which I really found helpful because I'm a paper and pen kind of person. So those were really fun to have handouts. Yeah, there's handouts and homework and it's a real class. One thing yeah. I hate is when people offer a free thing and you go on and it's just a sales pitch. Totally. And, uh, and when I created this free class, the guy who was pro doing the programming so that, you know, it would work where you push a button and you watch the class. Uh, he said, Lori, I have a lot of customers and they do free stuff, but it's like a 15 minute thing. It's, mm -hmm. you know, or a little or one page PDF or something. This is way too much to give away for free. And I said, my purpose is that people can experience this for themselves. Nothing's more convincing than you doing it for yourself. Yeah. Uh, and, and so they, they can tell whether they like it or not, you know, because I can you, attest. I to, yeah. I don't want people spending money with me if, if, if they, you know, yeah. It's not their thing. No, I can attest that that was a very, very generous four day class. I learned a ton. It sparked my interest and it made me say after the holidays, <laughs> I definitely want to take it. Um, so I don't think anyone would be disappointed. It's a fabulous class. Absolutely. Thank you so much. The video yeah. is not perfect though. <laughs> Who cares? Yeah. The teacher Please. is awesome. Yeah. So it's, it's, it is a, it, I, I think it's a good class. I think you'll get a lot out of it and it's fun. It's really fun. It, I like yes. that's That's one thing. Mel Riley became my best friend for many years. He passed away in 2020, but he oh. said, he said, Lori, you're going to get to be known as the fun CRV teacher. <laughs> Absolutely. I, you I, make I, it fun. I, the subconscious mind works better if it's having a good time. You know, we all do. Yeah. So yeah. rather than make things really serious because psychic things must be serious, I think <laughs> it's a lot more fun to just have a good time. And I love to make my students laugh. You know, we just have a really, really good time. Uh, one of my mantras, I, I, am I allowed to say a four letter word that's not real, that doesn't start Abs with that? Absolutely. Oh. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> one Speak of, freely. One of, my, one of my mantras to my students that I, that helped me so much when I suddenly had this dawn on me. You know, we, we are raised in a pass or fail culture, you know, and if you make a mistake, you're punished and all that kind of thing. So one of my mantras for my students that helped me really up my game was when I gave myself permission to make a mistake and I, and I gave myself a permission to make shit up. And I love remote, that. You, just give yourself permission to make shit up and you'll be amazed at how accurate you can be in a, in a remote viewing scenario. Okay. So. That is valuable <laughs> advice. Even in mediumship, there are times when I've been in classes and I see someone really nervous who's up learning to like get up there the first time. And the teacher will say, just pull something out of your butt. Just tell yeah. me the first thing you feel. And it's always right. 
So yes. that's beautiful. <laughs> it is. It, it, it's very, very helpful. So uh, anyway, that's my, if you hear snoring, it's because I have a big dog behind me and he burst into the door while we were doing this and he was snoring like an old man. So cute. Well, Lori, I know you have another appointment, but I want you to tell anybody anything else you have going on that you want to share or other ways they can find you. Yes. Oh, your free, your webinars that you do with Lynn all the time. Yeah, we just tell them yesterday. yesterday, Mm -hmm. Yeah, every month, uh, every month, it's usually the first or second Tuesday of every month. Um, We haven't set them up for January yet, but generally, usually, and we just did one yesterday, it was Tuesday. We always do it at noon mountain time. Where okay. are you again, Rianne? I forgot. Where you Tucson, are. Arizona. Oh yeah, you're in Arizona. And we're on mountain time. We figured yeah. that out that we're both yeah. in the same time. So, so anyway, it's it's mountain time, noon mountain time. And uh, we do a full hour webinar and you can ask any question you want. And uh, it's really fun. Yesterday's was amazing. And the questions were fabulous. Oh, I got to really listen. Great about viewing and psychic information. Um, so we do that. That's free. We, we're both big believers in giving a lot of stuff away for free. If you go on my website at intuitivespecialist.com, there's a, ton, there's a tab that says free stuff. Mm-hmm. And it's a ton of free stuff. It's like lots of free stuff besides the free masterclass. So we have a lot of free things because we want people to learn this. We want people to, you know, up their, their consciousness because consciousness is the new frontier. Consciousness is the way to go. You know, it's, we, we got to raise our consciousness and that's the only way we're going to solve the problems that are facing all of us, all mankind, the planet and everything right now. So I have that, I have the books. I'm going to be doing a book launch because we're going to be putting boundless up on audible very soon. It's already recorded. And we're, yeah, we're going to, so it will be in, uh, available on audible. And when I do that, people who join the book launch and promote it to their friends and things like that, um, you know, we're going to be giving away special prizes and things. We, we've got a, we, we're planning this book launch and that, um, if, if you go to my website and you take the free class, you'll get on my mailing list and that's how you'll find out about all this fun stuff. So, um, just go to the website. We have another free class on the website. It's a written class, but it's called secrets of the ancients. And it teaches Ooh. you how to use a pendulum and how to get all kinds of really cool information with a pendulum. So, Oh, lots of, I gotta do that. Lots of free goodies on the website. So as soon as you do those, if you sign up on my mailing list, then you'll be find out when we're doing the launch and and how to do that. And uh, we also, and I think the week that we do the audible launch, we're going to reduce the Kindle version, the price of the Kindle book, the boundless. Mm -hmm. We're going to reduce it, I think to like 99 cents for the week. Wow. Oh, nice. People could get the Kindle version for like 99 cents. Uh, did, you re- also- did you read your own audible book? Is it your voice? It's my voice. I guess I read it. Those are my favorite. It's funny because my, my daughter has narrated 30 audible books. So I said, maybe you should just narrate <gasps> oh. my book. She said, no, mom, people are going to want to hear you. They're yeah, not gonna we want to hear you, Lori. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> so I narrated it myself. Um, and I'm about a third of the way done with Boundless 2. Yay. Uh, yeah. My goal with the books, just so people understand, my goal with bound, the Boundless books is that I thought there is no really good book out there that teaches remote viewing from a book in an easy, palatable format. Right. You know, something something that's not as big as the family Bible with microscopic print. This is a normal size book. And it's got, right here. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. With all normal. my notes. <laughs> I'll hold so it that, a little longer. Thank you. That book, uh, yeah, that we're gonna, we're coming out with boundless to um I don't know when exactly because I'm still working on it. And writing a book always gets pushed to the last thing when you're playing whack-a-mole all day long with all kinds <laughs> yes. of stuff that's happening. But uh anyway, so I've been trying to get that book done and and in fact, that's who I'm meeting with in, in, in 10 oh. minutes. I'm meeting with my, my book uh, coach. I have a book coach. So I, I need, need a book coach. I keep getting psychics telling me I'm supposed to be writing a book and I don't even oh. know where to start. I need a book coach. It's outside of the interview and I'll give you all kinds of tips on how you can, how you can do it. I'll hook you up. Please hook email, you up, girl. <laughs> email when you email me the special link, put anything in, else in there that you want. I'm open. Okay. That'll be great. And so is there anything else? So we've got the book launch coming up with the audible book launch. And plus we're going to reduce the price of the boundless to 99. When's your cents. next online class, your next oh. real online class. Cause I know I'm you just, I, I am embarrassed because I just finished the advanced class this last week. I taught Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, nine to five. Oh, uh, we had, we had 19 students. Um, and normally by October, I have my whole next year of classes <laughs> on the website. 
Okay. And we don't have any yet because, oh goodness, that's my reminder. Sorry. No. We don't have any up yet because we just have not been diligent to get them out there. And so, uh, my, Pavel and I, my, my executive director's name is Pavel and he's from okay. Poland and he and I are going to be, uh, setting up the next 90 days of classes. Um, and we're, we're, we promised each other, we're going to do it this week. We keep getting, okay. we will put them on the calendar. We're still alive and we're going to be teaching. So <laughs> good. So good. We, Cause I can't wait. My goal. I just have one last thing. I, my goal w- was okay. When I was going through this journey, what was my biggest battle? Well, I was lonely and I felt like I couldn't get my questions answered fast enough. Cause Lynn mm-hmm. had his hands full and he was single. He didn't have any help. I have help now. <sighs> But, uh, you know, and I just felt lonely. So I thought I want my school to be the most holistic place that anybody wants to learn controlled remote viewing can come to where they can learn basic, intermediate, advanced. We have a post-advanced class called Beyond Advanced CRV for professional viewers, for people who want to go the professional route. We also have a class called Medical Applications. It's a healing class like you've never (gasps) experienced. Amazing. And uh, we have- I want the ball. Yeah, we have a monitor's class and they're all three-day courses. We also have a course that's one of the most popular. That's the associative remote viewing course, which is the one that people can use to go play the lottery or go to the casino. And that's oh, fun. But it's not <laughs> my favorite course, but it's a lot of other people's favorite courses. I'm sure. <laughs> and then... Um, and so, and I'm, I'm also working on getting video versions. I have a video version of base of basic and a video version of intermediate, and I'm working on the advanced intermediate. I mean, the advanced video class and okay. the ARV video class. Um, and that way people can, you know, that can't spend three days watching me on camera can, uh, can watch at their own convenience. So these are all things we're working on the books, the video courses, the three day live classes, they're all happening. <laughs> so. You have got so much exciting stuff going. I, I, I'm overwhelmed and I'm like making notes of all the classes I want to take. I just need all this time to take all these classes, but I'm excited. Oh, Lori, it's been so be much fun. Out with a gift card. All a bunch of students said, please come out with a gift card because yeah. we, we want, they want their families to buy a gift card so that to pay for their next class. Brilliant. Yes, please. <laughs> so we are. We're coming out with a gift card. Uh, so anyway, guys, thank you so much for having me, Rianne. I'm super glad. I like you so much. We've got to get together again. I would absolutely love that. I can't tell you how much I've appreciated your time and all the great information. And it was just absolutely wonderful. Thank you, Lori. Well, thank you so much. Okay. I'll talk to you soon. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Bye-bye. Thank you so much for joining me today on All Is Not Lost. I love sharing stories and interesting guests with you each week, and I love knowing that you're here listening. If you're enjoying this show, please rate and follow wherever you get your podcasts. This helps me continue to bring you dynamic guests and valuable content. If you'd like to be a guest, please visit allisnotlostpodcast.com and click Be a Guest. And if you would like to learn more about me and the readings I offer, please visit the About Rianne tab. I'm always open to new topic ideas. So if you have something you'd like me to talk about on the show, please send me an email at hello at allisnotlostpodcast.com. Thank you again so much for listening, and I'll see you next time.